Yo, yo. What's happening, people? Looking at Tim coming off of his caffeine high. <laughs> this feels so good. It feels so He's, good. What what would possess you to not drink coffee all day? Well, I was in, I started early this morning and we were out. Usually we have a mason jar in the fridge from like a lo- local coffee shop. Unfortunately, that ran dry yesterday. And I didn't quite have time this morning to stop on the way. So I just, just poor planning, poor planning. That's, that's the, the long and short of it. Who lives without coffee? What a terrible decision. I don't know, but yeah, I was crippled by noon and now I'm, I feel alive. So I'm ready to go. Watch out. <laughs> Coming for you. Coming for you. Dude, that's, that's the truth though. For me, like I have to have coffee in the morning. Like life isn't okay unless I've, I've had coffee. And about noontime yeah. is my last caffeinated coffee of the day. But it's, it's critical. Like it's, yeah, it, it, it has to happen. Like I just feel like, like I'm alive ready to go it's you got to do it got to do it plus t- coffee's delicious so why wouldn't you just have a d- delicious beverage I don't, I don't have an answer coffee yeah. is god's gift to the world it sure is my investment into it is excessively necessary <laughs> and high <laughs> <laughs> It all it all works out. But all right, so we're going to talk through kind of a wrap-up of TPC, some things we took away from it. Um, I was there on Sunday. I live right up the street, so that was cool. Wild weekend, crazy weather. Special shout-out to everyone on that grounds crew. They are spectacular. I mean, it yeah. was – the course was immaculate, even with the amount of rain that downpoured there. I mean, it was wet when we were there on Sunday. But yeah. like the the grounds were just beautiful. I didn't watch a ton, uh, like soup to nuts. But do you know? Did, were they playing lift clean in place? They were on Saturday. I don't think they were on Sunday because Paul was, Casey was not allowed to lift his ball. I was gonna say I didn't see anyone, li- you know, uh, cleaning and stuff. So I was like, if they, I didn't if the grounds any. crew took care of it to the fact to the to the point that they didn't have to lift lift clean in place like two days there, that's that's impressive, guys. Impressive. But seeing as we just mentioned it, that sucked to watch. Yeah, Paul Casey, that, like beautiful, perfect drive, perfect, like three oh seven, perfect. And he, I mean. Well, he was two back at that point. Yeah. yeah. And it just ruined his day. And you saw it on uh, sa- uh, either Saturday or Sunday when they came out. I, I remember one of those days. First guy came out. I think it was like Scheffler. He caught a 30 mile an hour gust and went way long on 17. And then the next guy stepped up and there was no gust. And it knocked like his ball just didn't go. And he missed short. So it was just like, all right, all right. well. We've got to play the gusts and the kind of the lottery here. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have to look at like Justin Thomas, like somehow found a way to, I think he was two under. Like, yeah, no I bogeys. Mean, he, he and Bubba, no bogeys. That's amazing in that weather. No. And he, what do you say? He hit his pitching wedge 186 <laughs> yards twice. Yeah. And, and his then five he hit, wood, like 150. Yeah. He had a, he had 180 yard uh, or 190 yard five foot and 185 yard pitching wedge. Awesome. Nuts. Nuts. Yeah, it, was, it was fantastic. Yeah. It was, Super cool tournament to watch. Um, I don't know if anybody saw this. So we, on Sunday, we got there and we're walking around. And we started following the Hovland, Rom, Cantlay group. Because that was kind of the premier group Sunday morning. Yeah, solid group. So we're following them around. And so this was... (sighs) 12, maybe. Somewhere about there. 12, 13, somewhere around there. So... Rom is in the middle of the fairway and hits it into the woods. Oops. And after that, I just kept my eyes on him and he swung his club as hard as he friggin' could, like in anger, like a million miles an hour, club head speed, <laughs> like 300, fast as possible. And there were people that were like, what looked like to me, right? Close Five enough. or six feet away, like yeah. close. Yeah, Close. Yeah. And I looked at the guys around me and I looked at my girlfriend, Christy, and I was like, had somebody by chance walked past that, 
their head is going to be on the green, decapitated, oh, yeah. like, killed them fully. Oh, yeah. I remember being like, that was a little bit reckless. And maybe on TV they might have showed it, but in person, no. a bunch of the people around me were like, that was a little wild. Like he just took like a really hard swing. Yeah. And it was just like little stuff like that. I was like, Oh, that was a little hot. Yeah. Some of these guys are really, really passionate. I guess you would say like they get, they get heated. And I always think like you, you obviously see the guys in the get, like they hit it into the gallery and then they have a narrow shoot to hit it out. Right. And I always think like, why do, why do they allow them so close? Cause all you need is one bad thing that like one, you know, reactionary pull, even if he's just like at his finish, like pull back or something like that, or pull it down from there, like, uh, or just one, sli- you know, shitty lie and one slight miss hit. And you just, you, you know, killed someone. I mean, you're yeah. dead. Yeah. If you hit them in the head, you hit them in the head, they're dead. Hit them in the right like, spot. Dead. Yeah. Like super dead. I mean, that's the kind of way. So they were, they were teeing off. I want to say this might've been 15. And so there's like, tea box and there's a tree in front of it and i'm kind of like like looking around the tree and i was thinking to myself like i, I don't know <laughs> I, don't, I know i don't really think i want to be here like so we literally like stepped to the side and started walking across and i was like i can see their tea shop from here it's fine so. oh dude i like i prefer to watch the tea shots from the fairway because you can see them coming in and their trajectory and stuff when I stand at the tee box or near, like I, I just lose the ball. Like it's just gone. And I'm like, all right, cool. It sounded good. Yeah. Yeah. I got really close for a couple of them and I videoed cause I was trying to get like a feel for uh, Rom and Cantlay specifically, yeah. like seeing how they drove the ball. Cause Rom has that just short, yeah, violent swing. I mean, it's just, it's so fun to watch and hop and um, Cantlay's is not, he's like very long. Yep. And so it was fun to kind of watch both of them, by the way, Wherever you are, Cantlay, screwed me this weekend. Now, to be fair, I had him competing against the winner. Okay. So I had no chance. I'm out. I, I could have picked anybody, and yeah, it didn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, like, the effort wasn't there for me. Killer. <laughs> Killer. But I, I digress from that point. Uh, all right. Second topic. The Daniel Berger conundrum. Yeah. Interesting stuff. I know you were texting me when this happened. Uh, Again, some passion in this conversation, I think. Right. I mean, first of all, PGA Tour needs this. Golf needs disagreement. You know, it's just like they need a little bit of feud between players. So I I I was okay with that. And I think you need to see how they handle those situations, right? Because ne- none, yeah. like none of the three, said anything that was like offensive or rude or anything like that. They were all just no. very, they were all just very sure of that. Well, not even sure because they, they, a couple times they admitted like I'm not actually not positive, but they were just very. They had conviction with what they were saying and they uh, believed in what they were, you know, arguing for. Yeah, I agree. So for anyone that didn't see this, because I talked to a lot of people, they were like, "What happened?" Like, yeah, you, you didn't see this, or because if you weren't watching the group, I guess you would have missed it. They talked about it briefly when they got to eighteen. Um, like, were they going to shake hands, and how was that going to look? Yeah. And obviously, they did. But so on the sixteenth hole, second shot for Hovland, Damon, and Berger. Berger was the furthest back to the right. I think he uh, he hit it like two twenty one off the tee. I want to yeah, say he, on, on he played for distance, so he just I think he hit like a hybrid or uh, two iron or something, something like that. So anyway, so he goes to hit. Sees first and hits a cut, or claimed to hit a cut, and yeah. essentially did hit a bit of a cut. Mm-hmm. But it got in the water. It was hard to tell where the ball went in the water. If you're looking from behind him, there's really no way. It kind of looks like if you're watching the shot tracer at its apex, down it goes. Like that's roughly where it went in. Well, Berger thought that it went in way further ahead. There's like a dark grass patch that you can see. From behind, it appears that it went out somewhere yeah. around there. Maybe a little in front of that, but it's hard to tell. Well, Victor Hovland walked up. Damon, not as much. Him and his caddy were like, yeah, we don't really know where it is, but we're not really comfortable with you taking a drop up there. Right. Hovland was like, I'm sorry, man. I don't think that ball went up there. Like, yeah. I think you came, I think you were way further back here. And so Berger was like, in a kind way, screw both of you. 
yeah, I that definitely didn't was up there. Yeah, yeah. That, no way, no way. I mean, he was like, I'm, and finally they came to like the conclusion, which in my mind, the referee came over. To me, he should just make that decision. No. Well, it's tough because so that usually they have if they have video evidence, they just refer to that and they're like, no, sorry, right. wrong. They didn't have that. So the tricky part with the rules official is he ne- he wasn't necessarily watching that shot. Right. So if you're not if you're not if you don't have eyes on the shot and what happened, then it's hard to make a ruling out, you know, on a on a kind of subjective matter like that. Yeah. So then it's really up to the discretion of the player who hit the ball and his playing partners based on what they saw. That was I mean that that was the tough thing cuz the shot tracer he, the ball definitely cut, right? 100% but it looked like it looked like right at as we were talking after after the apex it looked like at that point it was probably over water now i don't know like it's tough depth perception wise to know how far the grass carries to the edge of the water right right, right. without but, knowing the math behind it which they're not going right. to calculate no. here and there no. um and without a bird's eye view like from yeah. up top that would you be like the it. oh it's right. right there right. right that's that's exactly where it dropped but without it and where wow. it hit, where it hit the water was pretty close to the, to the, you know, water line. Like it, it, didn't, yeah. it didn't just land in the middle of the water. So that's the tricky thing is like, yes, it moved from left to right. I don't know how much, and I don't know when it was over water, but somehow yeah. it landed pretty close to the shoreline. I mean, it was like what, 10 feet. Yeah. I mean, no, no more than 15. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it was far. So no, I mean, as a whole, I thought it was handled relatively well. Like I saw both people's positions. Yeah. I I give credit where credit is due, where Berger was like, I think this is crap. And in his mind it yeah. was. And I give Hovland credit for being like, hey man, I'm just trying to keep this under integrity. Like I'm not trying to screw you. Like I'm yeah. just I'm telling you what I think. But then it basically comes down to an opinion, player versus right. player. I don't really like that that's solving that equation. No, I don't either. And I mean, three and a half million dollars is on the line, right? So it, the difference, you know, you can make, o- you made over a million dollars, I think, top three. So yeah. like those three spots are coveted and those guys were up, right, right up contending for those spots. So Berger I have no problem. Was nine under at the time, eight yeah. under at the time. Like, and I think and Hovland he was in was, striking distance. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Hovland was right around there too, like eight. Um, Hovland screwed himself on, on 18 because yes. He, hit it in the water and then hit yes. his three wood past everybody. I, I, know, I know. So there was, there was that. Crazy. Speaking of, did, what did you think of Smith going with driver on 18 with three strokes? I think you just hit what you're comfortable with, honestly. So I'm okay with that. I, the second shot, I don't get because like, if you were, if that was you or I in that pine straw trying to punch out with a slow, a fairway sloping to, to the water, like it was, yeah. I would expect you or I to potentially hit it in that water and like misjudge distance, right? Like catch it too good and hit it a little. For sure. I would For expect sure. him. I would expect him to just take take the best angle, hit it. What, who cares if he hit it forty yards? Dude, and hit then it you just twenty yards. Yeah, I mean, just take your medicine the way, there. And... Yeah, the way he's hit, he was hitting his wedges too. I mean, he was knocking the pin dead, and he did he did on the next shot anyways. Right, but he was a stroke back. Yeah, exactly. It was like, dude, you don't have to make it this this close. But uh, yeah, that, that better, easier tough. easier said than done from our position, of course. But oh, yeah, of course. that was I mean, that was definitely us, tough. Us couch quarterbacks over here just calling it calling it what it is. But uh, but imagine like Lahiri's on the tee behind you. You you just punched into the water and you're like, oh no, 100%. this is not over. Yeah, tragedy for Keegan Bradley too. Yeah. Uh, what, a Keegan, brutal, I, what a brutal, what a brutal, he had a chance to be like in second. I know. I have a soft spot in my heart for him too. Cause like, I, I remember him on Faraday a couple of years ago and he was just like, I think I, I'm nervous. I'm going to lose my card every week. Like someone's just going to come up to me at the tournament and be like, sir, you need to turn in your pro card. It's, need like, to Keegan, leave. it's like Keegan, you are a very good golfer. You do not need these negative thoughts. Like I just want him to do well. I, I feel so bad. Wow. But I mean, he, he, what? Three putted seventeen, yeah, and doubled eighteen. Yeah, you can't. I do mean, that. that is a brutal, brutal ending. You, you just lost four strokes. I know that that could have been like five, uh, five or six places too. Where we're talking, you know, yeah, big difference. He, he was a shot. 
I think he was one off. He was like 12 under or 11 under, 12 under. Yeah, he was, he was right up there. When he went to seven. So, I mean, he dropped to eight. Yeah. It's oh, brutal. Tough look, tough look. But it was fun brutal. to watch. And um, like my father-in-law on Sunday, we were watching some of it. And he was like, can you believe, uh, I forget who he was talking about. But can you believe what's his name shit the bed yesterday? I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> like, I, yeah, we got a we got a whole judgment here. The, the time, conditions time. were less than ideal. Yeah, when three of the top ten players in the world put it in the water yeah. on seventeen, yeah. and then I think did Kepka put it in at the drop area? Uh maybe I didn't see his second drop. But somebody might. somebody hit it in the water and then hit it in the water from the drop area. Oopsies! And I think in the interview afterwards, Kepka was like, "You know, what's the second hardest hole in the course?" And he was like, "The drop area on 17. <laughs> I love it. What did you see? Take, did ahead. you see the image of the uh, overlay of like a five to fifteen handicaps dispersion in the seventeenth green? <laughs> it's like five <laughs> yards outside of the seventeenth green in all directions. So it's like yes, it's not. It's not even on. It's nowhere near the green. Yeah, yeah. I just nowhere. I saw that this morning and I was like, ah, oh, that's perfect. It's, I mean, it's pure luck. Yeah, pure luck. If you strike it well enough, you're gonna feel like it's not. Like if, if I put it on the green, I'm like, hey. I mean, I'm just spectacular. I'm sorry. Yeah. Throw throw me on the tour. That's all there is to it. <laughs> Watching them. Also, one of those. Th- so I-, I chuckle about this when I go play. And we've obviously watched Manolo talk about like where you should be, like yeah. where you should be playing from with T-Box. Watching them play at that distance. Mind boggling. Yeah. Mind boggling. Like it's, it's already 60 yards ish at least further back than a good player plays from. Yeah. I mean, their, their average is like 7,600 yards and at least there are a lot of older courses around, around Boston, but I mean, most courses around Boston are, are lucky if they're touching 7,200 and some of them feel really long and you're like, this isn't, this isn't in the same ballpark as them. Even the shorter ones. Yeah. What is the I, longest course? What's the longest course in the I think Ki- I think Kiowa last year uh, was, was for the, the US Open. They extended it. It was like 8,100 at its at its longest or something like that. I'm pretty sure that was it. Uh, Tory 77.65. Yeah, Kiowa was, was longer. I know that. Oh, yeah, here it is. Kiowa, 78.76. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then they had extended a couple of like the par three on, I think it's like 13. There's a 200 over 200 yard par three that they made like 250. I remember that. Crazy. Just crazy. Wasn't that the one that was on the water? Uh, Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty much a carry. It's like a 200 yard carry into the screen. It's nuts. Yeah. I was was just looking at that. And that's here. And the difference with them too, is their precision with like even the long club. So I, I know Danielle Kang, I think, said this. It was in a Golf Digest article, but she was like, what people don't realize about the LPGA players is that they hit their, like, three wood to a very tight dispersion. Like, they hit those clubs very well. So it's not just that they're, like, driver wedge, driver wedge. It's, I mean, they hit everything good. They're fabulous to watch play. Yeah. It's just just high-level athletics in every way, shape, and form. Yeah. There's no, it's... there's no question about it. You know, I actually, that was one of the things that I, I kind of was like writing down some of the top things I took away from being at the tournament and watching it over the weekend. And one of them that maybe doesn't get mentioned as often, none of these guys for the most part are unathletic looking. No, there are a handful, they, but most there's of them a handful. Look... I mean, yeah. but generally speaking, like walking next to them, you know, they may not be like big and bulky and jacked, but they're also not morbidly obese. Right. You know, they're not, they don't tend to carry on a bunch of extra weight. You know, no offense to like the Harry Higgses and the Shane Lowry's, which I saw his ace on 17 from behind. Oh yeah. That was awesome, dude. Yeah. So we were behind like the little gallery of people that stands like right behind the green. So yes, we were looking yes. at the stands. Dude, so much fun. Uh, that, like that to was... watch him from afar, like the double fist, like it was just so, <laughs> so fantastic. Oh, but, that's awesome. Oh, dude, the crowd. <sighs> that's awesome. First the one in. Uh, spilling everywhere. Yeah. First one in a couple of years, I think, right? Three 2019 years, was the last yeah. one. Yeah. But uh, as, as just a general statement, everyone looks in shape. Yeah. Like they, they look like they take care of their bodies. 
Uh, I saw some uh, TPI or somebody posted about Cam Smith, like he likes his specific exercises and he likes to do those really well and get strong doing those. And yeah. um, so I saw some people talking about like the general athleticism, but as a whole, watching them play, um, that was definitely something that I took away from it. The second thing, all of them are violently elegant when they swing a golf club. They all do it differently, which I kind of like. Like everybody's got, just like in basketball, everyone has a different shot. Every quarterback throws the ball a little bit differently, but their outcomes are all very, very similar. But they are so violent with ease. Just violent elegance is the way I'll put it. It's just so fun to watch. Um, But that is a, you know, product of being able to handle that force effectively. 100% just all managing force you know you see jt hit a 320 yard drive and he's 5'9 160 pounds i mean Mm. that's just manipulating force really really well all right it's so fun to watch him and rory hit the ball off the tee right it's just yeah so fun so fun yeah poor Uh, what was the statistic anybody that played on saturday didn't finish in the top 15 oh was that a stat i didn't see that it was something oh, I'd have to because on Saturday was all the wind. Yeah, yeah, that was a tough so, day. Anybody that like played a full round that day, from what I gathered, like did not make the top fifteen. Oh, geez. Because like Cam Smith had nothing to do on Saturday. Yeah, right. He played two rounds Sunday. Yeah, or one and three quarters. One right. So for the people that played full rounds on Saturday, I think the vast majority of them did not make it in like the top twenty or fifteen. I'd have to look up the stat again, but somebody was mentioning that to me, which makes. Perfect. I mean, it's 40 mile per hour gusts or 30 mile per hour gusts. I mean, the wind yeah. was like, we went outside and we're like trying to walk the dogs and I'm like getting blown over. Uh, yeah. No, I, oh, yeah. It, it was pretty amazing. A couple of those shots, like just get knocked down by the wind or uh, yeah. you see a couple of them just get into the jet stream and just go. It's it, pretty, pretty fun. And then I always love the soft green. Some people hate it because it's just like easy. But when you see those guys just like throwing darts into soft greens like that, I mean, that's, that's fine. How can you hate that? So so fantastic because it's showing how good they are yeah like when it's really fast like obviously we're seeing how good they are but the green is in full control of that ball right like they're essentially like a quarterback or a baseball player like an outfielder throwing it to home like just pinpoint accuracy yeah no and controlling their spin like some you know a couple of shots i saw literally bounce and land two inches from the divot and not go anywhere and that's incredible spin yeah. control it's crazy. Wild. Dude, it was crazy to me to watch the guys in 17 that were putting that much backspin on it. And like the guys who were short being like, oh, oh, yeah. oh. And then it hits that little rough edge and stops. Um, but then watching the guys that were like putting, I mean, essentially what Lowry's ace was. Just yeah. Put it past the pin, let it Play roll the back. Slope. And, yep. And it yep. goes, yeah, that was that was cool. Other cool thing. So we ended up following Homa towards the end of the day. Yeah, I love And his, sto- his story about chicken fingers at the airport was <laughs> fantastic. Like this man just made like a third of a million dollars and like just devastated. They don't have chicken yeah, tenders. Just crushing just, chicken tendies at Chili's. That's all he wants to do. Right. Right. I like Homa. I'm a Homa fan. I am too. I just, I just watched, there. I just watched him on Barstool. He had a good, uh, he did the four man scramble. He beat him, but uh, he's the man. Shut oh, yeah. up, Alexa. God damn. I know. She's, get out of my house, big brother. <laughs> Gosh. But uh, she's going to respond to that. Echo off. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, so we were, we started following him and off the tee box, put it right. He was in, he was in the woods in the shit somewhere. And so his, him and his caddy walk up. And one of the things I, I was like sitting, we were like walking right with them. A, when he walks, he reminds me of a velociraptor. Like yeah. he's leaning forward as he walks and his, like, yeah. it's almost like his legs are trying to like Flintstone and catch up yeah. to him. He kind of bounces a little bit too. Yeah. 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 Homer, yeah. you're never going to watch this, but if you do, I still love you. I just also <laughs> like the way you walk. But I pointed that out and I was just like, dude, he's about to like, like, I feel like he's about to like lift the claws and start to like, <laughs> like prance and run, but he gets up to his ball and he wasn't, he was in a tough spot. Like he was in, he was under a tree. He had a pretty straight shot, but he had some like overhang. And uh, his caddy was like, eh, no big deal. Like, it was just like so nonchalant. Like, yeah, like we'll, we'll be all right. Whereas like the amateur golfer, like if they put it in the woods anywhere, they're like, ah, oh, throw the club. This yeah. sucks. Like, I, what am I going to do from there? Like punch it out. 
and I watched him like punch it out. I think he hit it in front of the water and then hit it up from there. I can't remember exactly, but he made it. I think he parred that hole, but he took a situation that was like crappy and like made yeah. the most of it. And I think that that's such a big difference between amateurs and pros is like, that includes myself. It's like, I hit a shot and I'm like in the woods to the right, but it's a perfectly playable shot. I have right. options there, but I'm like devastated by it. It's always fun to see the pros that are like, yeah, I got a hankering for that. Or guys like Rom who are like, if anybody's in the way of this club, I'm going to cut your head off. Yeah, right. No, I, I like it too. I, I think it, it helps to have this, the uh, thought of it only takes one good shot. And a lot of those guys have it. It takes no matter where you are on the golf course, it takes one good shot to get you back in the hole. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a similar, I had a similar realization at TPC Boston a couple of years ago with uh, Adam Scott. He hit like, he hit this low draw from it, literally in the middle of the trees that just ran up to the front of the green to like 20 feet. I'm just like, yeah, that's, he just like walked up to his ball, found his window and hit it. And it was, yeah, effortless. Yeah. Isn't the Mickelson quote like birdies are found in the woods or something? Well, that sounds like a Phil thing to say. Yeah. There's like, a, I heard that song. God knows that's way out of context, but there's something <laughs> along the lines of like birdies are made from the woods or something. Um, but I, I, I've always enjoyed like seeing that. And to that end, this is something that I try to do more of and I should do more of. And maybe we'll make a video later about this. But, you know, we we always focus on what the bad shots were of around like, oh, if I'd only, you know, hit it a little straighter on that par 316th, I would have been OK. Or, oh, if I hadn't have hit that shot fat, then I would have scored this as opposed to, man, I stroked my drive on 12. Great yeah. drive, did exactly what I wanted it to do, hit an awesome approach shot, and got a great par on that hole. Like the focus on the negative aspects of how we play is just so under a microscope, like it's so magnetized or magnetized. Magnetized. Magnetized? That's not the word I'm looking for. Not, I don't, not, I... not, not mag like blown up. <laughs> not, <laughs> I don't know why. Magnified? Magnified. Magnified. Hey. Gosh, Let's go. English, Teamwork. English for the win. Magnified. <laughs> oh, gosh. The best part was when you said magnetize. I was like, oh, yeah, right. And then the 10-second the delay kicked in. I was like, nope, got nothing Wait a here. second. Hold on. Hold on. Magnetized. It's magnetized? <laughs> what? Where, where's, the, where's the electromagnetic field? I'm confused. Where's the magnets? Who's got uh, the magnets? No, no magnets. Uh, no, magnets. no, but it, is, it that's such a good point. It's uh, if Next time you go out, if, take like... I usually try to have two goals for the day and then at the end just assess how you did. So it's like, all right, today I'm going to do my pre-shot routine on every single shot, no matter what. Yeah. I'm going to, and then I don't know, something else. I'm not going to three putt. No. And it's like, you know, helps, just helps frame things, you know? Yeah. It's just keeping it all, keeping it all in perspective. And again, I think golf is such an easy sport to do that in because in other sports, like, even Steph Curry shoots, what, 38% from the three-point line? Yeah, somewhere around 40, yeah. Something yeah. like that. You know, like, and again, he's also a freak. But, like, I'd love to see, like, Michael Jordan's best year of field goal percentage. Like, best. Right. And, right. You know, it's it's probably just north of half. Yeah, it's probably right, yeah, right in that 55 to 60 ballpark. Right, just north of half. And you're thinking to yourself, and like, five out of ten shots are good. Five yeah. out of ten, and he's an outlier. Yeah, right. That's not the norm. The normal is much lower. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so I mean, I'm you al you always got to think the PGA Tour. Whenever, whenever I get mad at a shot, I'm like, all right, the PGA Tour average from hitting from the fairway into the green is 35 feet from the pin. So if I'm <laughs> if I'm inside 35 feet, that's a fantastic shot. If you're inside of 60 feet, that's a fantastic shot. Right. Like to be to be totally fair. Well, they talk about I think we talked about like dispersion rates with the driver. It's like yeah. 60 yards or 80 yards. Like it could end up anywhere between 60 and 80 yards for a yeah. pro golfer. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, you know, okay. I see it. Right. I You're gonna it. have them. You're gonna have them. It's true. It's true. It's true. So we'll segue now. That kind of I think that wraps up TPC pretty well. We talked about all the, the little fun things that happened. Super fun tournament. If anyone's never been, it's it really is spectacular i mean it is without question a fifth major they just won't call it it but it's yeah it looks i mean, I mean it, it is fun the people are fun like it's a great it's a great event 
Yeah, no, and live golf is always fun anyways, so you can put it in a beautiful setting like that, some good people around. That's Traffic it. is foolish, but dude, yeah, I saw I saw Joel Damon's caddy was like riding his bike to the course and all sorts. It's of easier stuff. to do that, to be honest. Yeah. It's just just ride your bike quicker, nice. Nice. unless you're staying over there and you can walk. Yeah, it's crazy. So we're gonna we're gonna touch real quick on something that's it gets overhyped a lot and it's not really well understood, um, and it's a lot of word vomit. But it's something that we do, or I have started, I've started to see more in golf circles, training wise. Um, and those are the concepts of dynamic correspondence and force vector training, um, which I, I think is a misnomer, like force vector, like vectors or forces. Like it's anyways. So yeah. essentially Any, what. Anytime you're moving, there are force vectors, but that's. But it's, it's a force vector, but yeah. and it's like a theory. Like, <laughs> yeah. So we're going to basically explain that on a more um, regular level that you know, Tim and I would use with any of the clients that are listening to this or any people that are, are watching. So dynamic correspondence is really just the idea that we want to have a like training transfer. Okay. So that meaning is that the movements that you do in training are mimicking the movements that you produce on the golf course. Okay. So that does not mean that exercises should look like the golf swing. It just means that we're trying to produce the same forces or we're trying to do movements that mimic the forces produced in the golf swing, right? So Tim can answer this question. What is the number one correlate to club head speed from an exercise perspective? Number one for golf, vertical. So vertical, vertical jump. jump, right? So that is a vertical force, Yep. right? And if you look at the golf swing, when you're getting into impact, you've seen Justin Thomas is the easiest because he's literally like vertically jumping. <laughs> right. He's off the at ground. impact. Right. He's yeah. off the ground. But you're noticing that his force is not moving further left or further back to the right. Obviously, there's a little bit of, you know, horizontal force. Mm -hmm. But as a whole, our biggest breakthrough of club head speed is vertical force production. How much you can push into the ground and push back up. That would be where the force vector theory from the ether <laughs> it sounds like such like this weird theory like it's like mystical i know it sounds so it sounds so complicated like force vector training but it's just it's just moving like it's looking at what you're doing and it's making sure that you're strong in those directions really like that's all it's it just, is yeah I, I don't know why it has to be so complicated um it's just what forces do we see in golf we see a yeah. very large vertical force produced. Okay, yeah. Remember, ground reaction force is we push into the ground, the ground pushes back. Thank you, Newton, for all of that lovely information, right? So that's mostly in a down direction. Obviously, we're shifting our weight, and then we're rotating, and there's torque and all of those things involved. But as a general statement, that's what we want to look at. What I want to delineate with everybody, and Tim, I'm going to have you elaborate on this, is the difference between force production in the gym and motor patterns in the golf swing. They they're, they don't have to be put together. And we've beaten this dead horse about don't do exercises that look like the golf swing. But I, I want you to elaborate a little bit more on that specifically is why we want to produce forces that mimic what we see in the golf swing, but not necessarily doing it inside of the golf swing mechanics. Right. Well, yeah, you get it gets sticky anytime you're doing stuff with weights, trying to mimic your golf swing. Right. Because we've, we've talked about before, your clubs are always the same weight, right? Your clubs are your clubs, unless you've gotten new clubs or you've added lead tape or whatever. It's always going to be the same weight. So really what we want to do when we're in the gym is to prepare the body physically for everything it's going to have to do in the golf swing, right? So like we just mentioned, you have your vertical force that you want to be able to uh, produce, but also control, right? Because we there are right. portions of the golf swing where we're probably going into a little bit of a squat. So we kind of have to absorb some, some force uh, in, in some places. And then we're trying to control a little bit of that horizontal movement, right? Shifting to that trail leg and then shifting forward, making sure we're still within our, within our feet, within our center of mass mm -hmm. or within our, you know, boundaries. And then we've got that rotational force, right? right? And we just want our body to be able to do those. So like, especially up, up North in the winter, when you're starting, you know, your off season training, honestly, people aren't doing much that looks like the golf swing. Nor should they be. 
Yeah, it's just let's build let's build the gas tank as big as we can. Let's get as strong as we can. Get your cardio tip top. Like just get you really good at moving. And then as we get closer to golf, we're gonna we can make some more stuff look like the golf swing because. I think too often in rehab, especially we're seeing, we're essentially seeing motor control drills, right? Putting yes. your body into positions, working on moving one part and not the other and, and working on controlling certain aspects of your swing. Mm -hmm. But that stuff isn't going to get the job done as far as this physical preparedness, right? This getting your body strong and ready to handle force. Correct. Correct. And to piggyback off of that, when you load the position of the golf swing or overload the position of the golf swing with different weights, like if you're using a heavier club head, that's much too heavy, or you're like doing cable chops that you're trying to mimic how that swing feels, your body is developing a different habit or motor pattern there. Standing on a BOSU ball and trying to do your golf swing, or you know, I saw one the other day, it was like Jameis Winston sitting on a physio ball and someone was like throwing balls at him. Yeah, yeah. Like tennis balls. And he's like, he's like catching them and dancing. And I'm like, <laughs> what, what is this? Like, this must just be for the gram. Like, you know, do it for the do it for the gram. But those things aren't as helpful. We have to what we want in training is we'll talk about force vectors, our dynamic correspondence. Doesn't mean that what we're doing is mimicking the athletic component or the mechanical right. components of golf. It's mimicking the forces produced. Okay. So let's dive into that a little bit more because that's what people are going to care about the most. Yep. The biggest forces produced are obviously, you know, up and down vertical forces, or for that matter, squat forces, right? Mm -hmm. The golf swing is not a hinge. It's not a, so, and by hinge, we would mean like a pull, like a deadlift, an RDL. We don't avoid those things, but you're mostly standing erect yeah. with slight knee bend. Yeah. And, and to not confuse anyone, you are in a hinged position, right? correct? But we're not, we're not moving up or down from that position necessarily. We're, we're right. trying to maintain that hinge throughout our golf. Zone. Right. It's not moving a ton. Like when you start looking right. at like the amount of like trunk flexion or forward bending that we get, right. it maintains a relatively steady right. position, right? It's totally. not difference being someone that's like a sprinter. That big Correct. forward lean, right? They're getting that knee way up towards their chest. Like they're getting that really deep position or like a broad jump. Right. Things of that nature. That's a different position. So we would want forces that mimic that. Well, we just talked about club head speed, the biggest correlate, vertical jump. Yep. Not broad jump, right? Which is going to create a little more of a hinge as you go to drive out. But a vertical jump, which tends to be a little more kind of down, quick and up. So personally for me, when it comes to, I'm going to say mimicking forces for the golf swing. And I'm going to say this with the exception of athletes who like maybe are younger and can jump mm -hmm. or we are doing like my 60 year old guys aren't jumping. No, no. Generally speaking. Right. But I am doing all of the other things necessary to load their lower bodies in those positions. I love doing isometrics, just getting Same. the muscles loaded, getting the tendons loaded, progressing that to like more eccentric work, which is. I'll call it bastardized triphasic training, which means nothing to anyone listening to this. Um, <laughs> but essentially good. all that, but essentially all it means is that we go from like a progression of loading your joints, making sure the range of motion is good, ensuring your tendons, ligaments, and muscles can handle forces appropriately. And then we do a little bit more movement, a little bit more controlled up and down. So the body's getting used to it. And then we get a little bit more, I'm going to call it violent with it, where it's yeah. like more full motions that are being a little more aggressive, but you're never leaving the ground. Right. That could be like a split squat hold and then like a slow eccentric split squat and then a regular split squat with a focus on the concentric portion or the standing portion. Right. Yep. Yep. We're still focusing on like a squat movement, but we're progressing it from controlling the movement, getting it strong, making it move a little quicker using like a um, stress shortened cycle mm -hmm. and then progressing that to being a little more. So when we talk about intent. Tim Ravota, Dr. Tim Ravota, what does it mean to have intent when we exercise? It's moving with, with aggression or with, at least with a, a certain goal in mind. Intent, so, if you may. Intent. I was trying to define it without using intent. <laughs> damn it. 
<laughs> I hear, heard my third grade teacher, Mrs. Hogan, going, don't define a word with the word. <laughs> Whatever, Mrs. Hogan. I'm just out here trying to make life easy. <laughs> Yeah. So, don't hate the player girl hate the game <laughs> shout out miss hogan wherever you are uh, shout out yeah it's uh, a catchphrase just can't you can't use that word you just can't use it but it's the thing that you do aggressively but with control it, and it's got to be fast but not too fast with purpose and intent intent damn it it's the worst oh it's fantastic uh, so anyways that's but that's what we're for, looking for yeah in the golf world, that's, you know, without getting into the super weeds of physics and force vectors, I just don't like it. But uh, that's essentially what, so dynamic correspondence is basically just, we want to produce the forces in training that we're going to be seen in the sport of choice. In golf, we have a ton of vertical force. We do have lateral forces. Don't get me wrong there. We are seeing lateral forces and a ton of rotational forces. You know, a lot of people don't uh, in training don't like to do rotational things with their athletes. Um, I used to feel that way. I don't feel that way as much now because golf is a rotational sport. Mm-hmm. I just don't do like ting tang, walla walla bing bang, ooh ee, ooh ah ah. Nigel, Nigel Thornberry. Nigel. Oh gosh. I don't like doing things that look like the golf swing from a rotational perspective. Yeah, me too. But I do like building power rotationally still. Like I like doing med ball slams side to side. I like wall med ball slams or wall med ball throws. Um, I like overhead kind of to the side. I do like still building that. Just not like I'm trying to swing a golf ball that direction or a golf, a golf club that direction. Right, right. And I, I like, uh, for people that can handle jumping, I like the rotational jumps too, because that's, yep, yep. I, I feel like a lot of times that helps people feel what it's like to use the ground to generate that rotation versus yes. using your upper body to generate that rotation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you can get right. rotation out of like a lunge too, right? You could just, yeah. you could just emphasize some kind of dropping the hips and, and turning into, into your hips a little bit more on a lunge and you can build up some rotational, some rotational strength. There's plenty of ways to do that. There's also the ability to create isometric rotational strength. So we'd like yeah. anti-rotation presses, uh, different cable chops, different cable lifts, um, ab wheel type work, plank work, where you're still developing rigidity and strength of your core, mm-hmm. um, but you're not having to do as much rotation with it. Um, you know, that is one of those things that I do like to do, especially in the beginning with people that are undertrained or not trained is can you hold these static positions and be comfortable in them? And then we work on starting to get more violent, so to speak, in performing those. A hundred percent. I, yeah, that I couldn't have said that better. That's uh, I mean, if you can't hold a position, I don't know how you're expected to use your muscles to control that position through, through space, you know? Now, to be fair for everyone listening, that doesn't mean that we don't want, so we just talked about isometrics. That doesn't mean I want you to just wall sit for the first six months of training. Correct when we're learning new patterns, right? So for everyone that Tim and I do an assessment on, we're looking at, can they squat? Can they hinge? You know, what's their pelvic movement look like? Are they able to rotate? We want to know all of those things. And if you're new to training, a hinge can be hard. You're like, I don't understand how the position goes. So although we may do things like single leg bridging, or we may do different, you know, RDL holds or whatever it ends up being, you're still going to go through those movements. Like, okay, we're going to work on the motor pattern of that here. We're going to do some squat stuff. Hey, I want you to work on this motor pattern again. So it's not that you're just doing X and then moving on from that. Like we're always developing the pattern. We're always developing your ability to squat and all of that. We're just loading it differently throughout time, depending on where you are at, you know, training wise, if you're novice or not. Yeah. I mean, you want your body to be able to do everything it needs to do in golf and out, right? Yeah. Like golf, I mean, golf is life for, for a lot of us, but you're doing, <laughs> you're spending most of your week, I would imagine, unless you're in a very uh, privileged position to that you're, you're spending more of your time during the week doing other things other than golf. So you still want, like, you want to be able to grab the groceries out of the car and, you know, stand up off the couch without using your hands and all that, all that fun stuff too. Tim's getting deep. Golf is not life, but is life not golf? I mean, golf, golf is definitely life. That's golf. Golf is life. <laughs> Like, although 
So one of my favorite guys, Stogies and Bogies, shout out to my dude. Uh, he's got a shirt that says golf is secondary. <laughs> I like that. And I'm a big fan. I like that. I haven't big. seen that. I missed it. Oh yeah. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta, I should, we should reach out to him. We're going to do a collaboration. We're going to do a golf strong by Stogies and Bogies collab. Be great. Hell yeah. I'll send this to him. It'll be, it'll be perfect. Um, I think that covers, that covers everything, you know, on a, again, you can get into the weeds with that stuff. You don't need to, you know, the, no. the point of it being is that we want to create a lot of vertical force as golfers, which makes sense. So your training should in some way emphasize that. Yes. Maybe a final point that I'll make is you also have to remember that don't compare your training to a 20 year old or a 16 year old, because if you're 50 and you're like, well, I don't know how to produce all those forces. Something to consider too, is that your training is different, right? A 20 year old, I could give them the crappiest workout plan ever and they'll respond to it because they're just better responders, right? They're younger. They're a little right. more plastic. Um, and then your genetics play a role. Like some people are just genetically more gifted in the weight room. They just respond quicker to training than others, right? A 50 year old who's <laughs> my, my buddy sent this to me earlier. He's like, it's like poor 50 year old guys or 60 year old guys. They're like, it's not my fault that your endocrine system just sucks. Like I didn't invent yeah. the thing. I'm just here to help you with it. All right. <laughs> like the little blue pill can only help you so much. <laughs> right. But that's a true thing to remember it's, is that your training does not necessarily look like a 20 year old because guess what? You don't respond to the things that they do. Correct. Correct. And uh, your golf game also doesn't respond directly to your training, right? You yes. still have to put yes. in the reps on the driving yes. range and on the course and all of that. This is yeah. just to physically prepare you for the work that you've got to put in on the golf swing after the fact. I'm a perfect example. Yep. I am bigger. I am stronger. Like I'm, I've power lifted and weight lifted my whole life. Like strength is not one of my problems, right? Like power things. Like I threw javelin, like I've done really big movements like that my whole life. Tim will outdrive me probably any day of the week right now because the mechanics of my game are still developing and I'm getting used right. to all of those things. Right. So it's great that I'm strong. And one of the perks to that is that I actually handle the golf swing really well. Like I'm rarely ever sore from mm -hmm. golfing at all because I do work through all of those things and I feel comfortable with it, but it's a mechanical portion that I still have to work on. So although I am strong, it does not mean I'm going to play amazing golf. Like I still have to hit the ball. Well, yeah, you got to figure out how to use that strength. Right. 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 Which was today. Today I had a had a great lesson with my guy, my guy Gary Shankland over at Sawgrass Country Club. Just just out there, just getting a little taller, get nice and deep you, in my back. So, oh, I felt good, man. I love good. it. And he, you know, he's got to be a good teacher to be a, a PGA pro or at least a golf teacher. I don't know if he has the PGA, but uh, and have the last name Shankland. Yeah, because his father is a legend. Like Shank, you your last name is Shankland, and you're teaching people how to how to be better at how golf. To not, you, how to you not. have to be. Yeah, you have to Dude, be good at your job. I was so humbled. So we finished up my lesson, and we're at the simulator, and he uh, grabs a seven iron. So I used a seven iron the whole time, and I think the furthest I hit it was like a buck eighty one or something, right. maybe, maybe. And again, mind you, I am six inches taller. I'm huge relative to this guy as a general statement, like there's a video of us uh, that I might've put up recently. I look like the rock compared to him. Like I'm just it's huge. He walks up there with a seven iron and hits it like two Oh two or something. Yikes. Someone's got um, some speed. And I was like, golly, <laughs> was like scary. I just felt so good. Like I felt so good about how I just hit the ball and you just out hit it. 20 yards 20 with the same club that's just a random seven iron he grabbed off the wall it's like, yeah it's work oh dude it's, it's like awesome. poetry poetry in motion it's poetry. a skill it's a skill and as kevin kisner always says ain't no hobby definitely no. ain't no hobby no but it's a hobby for you know 99 percent of the population <laughs> <laughs> i love kids dude he's the best he is the absolute best. I, in that Homa video, he uh, against the Barstool guys, he was texting kids live because he, he was four down. Spoiler alert if anyone was. Uh, Homa was four down. He clawed back into it, and then he won in a playoff. And uh -huh. he's texting as he's – he just evened the score, and he texts kids, and kids goes, oh, my gosh, they're choking their dicks off. It's like, <laughs> yes. 
Yes, kids. I need more of you in my life. The, the tour needs more people like him. Guys like yeah. him and Homa, like Higgs, like they're great for the tour. Yeah. Uh, the, like the Young swing guys, row stuff. That, fun. Yeah. Yeah. The swing row stuff that Homa does and just like, it's all in good <laughs> yes. fun. It's just, you yeah, know. It's, it's just to play. It's just to have fun. Like that's the whole yeah. point of it. Like I, I love it. I, I just think it's so fun. So if anyone who didn't follow the other day, I uh, put up a video of like my beautiful golf swing naturally. And uh, Tim's like early extension, throw up. And I thought to myself in my head at that moment, I was like, this is the beauty of golf. Like I can tell you, you suck at something and we can like laugh about it. And like, it's fun. I'm like, whatever haters going to hate. You're not wrong, but you're still a hater. <laughs> you're still a hater. It doesn't you're matter. Still a hater. It's it is so the truth. That's what makes it so fun. I hate when people get so uptight about stuff like that. I know. I was talking to someone this morning about that. He was like, I've he used to play in a lot of charity stuff just for work and try to network and stuff. And he's like, I stopped because you get paired up with someone that's just not fun or it, like you can't you can't talk shit. Like if I'm out with my buddies and they hit a bad shot, I'm gonna be like, dude, what the hell was that? Or you know, you gotta be able to have some fun fun with that stuff. I don't care if I play in tournaments with people that are like that. I, my demeanor is unchanged. Yeah, yeah. Just push through. You have to push through. Yeah, like just like just push through. And usually they break and they're like, all yeah. right, you're right. Yeah. We're all just trying yeah. to have fun and we're all going to work tomorrow, right? And that work is not playing golf for three and a half million dollars. So No, like it's like yes, I'm out there to like I wanna win, I wanna have fun and all of that, which makes which makes total sense. But like yeah. it's a charity tournament, first of all, which is half the battle. So it's it's really not worth getting too fired up about for, for any given reason. So not at all. I, I don't know. Murph, you want to say hi? Come on. Say Come hello. On, What's going oh, on? Oh gosh, dude? he's disgusting. His brother's been uh, drool. Is he covered in drool? All over his ugh. My son, baby Bob, is doing this new thing where he just sucks on my cheek. Like I'll be holding him <laughs> and he just, he just he latches on here and then he comes off and it's just like the beard is dripping wet with just drool. Oh. He's just a leech. It's just a he's leech. Just, ah. Dude, the fact that he's baby Bob is yeah. terrific. Amara doesn't love it, but I am 100% st sticking with it. She's called she call Lil Bob. Yeah, Bob. What's up, Bob? It's his rap name. <laughs> uh, that's Lil, fantastic. Lil Bob, Lil Bob and the Boston Gangsters. Little Bob, he got a he. I got him some plastic golf clubs, so he. It's probably going to be another six months before he can stand and hold one. But hey, he got to lay. He got to lay the foundation. He can't even hold his head up yet. Yeah. <laughs> right. He was holding it uh, yesterday. He had just had like his hands. I had to hold the other end of it because at any time he tried to pick it up, it was just like just yeah, no grip strength. Terrible grip strength. It's the number one predictor of like mortality. I know. We got to get it. We got to get on it quick. Gotta work, start hanging him from the rafters. <laughs> I've got like a video, God knows where it is, of me when I was a baby and my dad taking me in the garage and just just like, hanging, just like, what's up, dude? And there's like <laughs> nothing under me. Oh, that's it's just fantastic. like, yeah, like what? Is, like I fall and die. What is what? <laughs> like I don't bounce. Yeah, uh, you'll bounce a little bit, not that, not that much. Yeah, with my head because it yeah. weighed like twice <laughs> as much as the rest of me. Exactly. It won't be a good bounce. Let's just no, put it, it won't, won't be a good bounce. Uh, I think that wraps it up. That was solid. Yeah. No, I think that's all, all we got to say on that. Make sure you're doing stuff that uh, transfers to your golf swing and still work on your golf swing. But doesn't look like your golf swing. That's it. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> don't, don't talk to me about I can't. I still haven't wrapped my head around what you told me last time. So <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Oh gosh. Anyways, so as always, shoot us a follow, Jackson.golfstrong, Tim.golfstrong on the Instagram gram to grams, golfstrongusa.com. Tim and I are doing some super cool things, which is which is awesome. Tim's grown up in Boston, just taking over Florida. Golf Strong USA is coming for the world. Yeah, let's do it. Change this thing. Or something like that. Something Sounds. like that. Sounds. <laughs> Baby Bob's gonna be our face. It needs to be like Carlos from The Hangover. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be the that'll be the way to do it. We can arrange that. We can. We got a yeah. baby Bjorn. We can arrange that. <laughs>
Keep so your eyes awesome. peeled for content of me on the golf course in April, or maybe maybe this week. It's been nice and here. This week, it's been nice with, with baby baby Bob and the baby Bjorn, just hanging off my chest, going for a ride. Yeah, nice <laughs> yeah. So awesome. Oh, also, happy St. Patty's to everybody. This will come out yeah on St. Patty's Day. Be sure to celebrate. We'll be at the uh, Dyed Green River of Savannah, enjoying a Guinness. Hell yeah! Have Boom fun. Be safe. Always happens as well. Oh, that's got to, yeah, that's that's a must. Why, why don't you make like a tree? And get the f*** out of here. Out of here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so good. Oh, great movie. All right, people. We'll holler at you. Peace.